Melissa, Melissa, um, didn't meet her, but met her brother and mother uh, back in 2010 when we visited Australia for the first and only time. We've got to go back over there. That was, that was a neat place. And, um, but then we got to over the years and uh, enjoy her music and her testimony. And she has written a number of songs that have real messages in them. And I, I'm so pleased that she's incorporated the words into the presentation. They're going to be on the screen. And uh, we're going to have to mix this. I don't know if you can get a, uh, we can get a picture and a picture mix there between the words and uh, Melissa as she presents songs that she's picked. She asked me, what is the message going to be about? What's the theme? The last song. <laughs> well, this first one's not bad. This is, this is not good. Uh, I mean, bad. you'll see why later on. <laughs> thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me the, um, join your church family for this morning. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Melissa Otto, and um, my husband Jason and our two little girls have just been traveling around your beautiful country for the last three months and we, we've got an, an old an old thing out the at the at the side of the building and yeah hopefully we'll make it for the rest of the way around <laughs> um, yeah so I'm just going to share a couple of songs that um, that my song I'm passionate about sharing them because they've they've the song they've come from times where God has really helped me to see more about who he is and who I am to him and um, and so yeah you guys have a, an amazing country it's we feel like we could explore here for, for the rest of our lives basically there's just so much to see but um, if you come to Australia you'll find that we have we have some nice beaches it is worth a visit as well so please come <laughs> we live a couple of couple of hours north of Sydney and yeah we'd love to show you around <laughs> um, so uh, I wrote this song, it was a family day at the beach, we were taking our family boat out and um, it was just, the, the, the weather was gorgeous, the sun was out, there was not a cloud in the sky and it was just one of those times where you just sit, you just sit I was just sitting there in that morning just going wow, this is a good day, it's just that buzz in the air, it's just with all the people that I love and, and, and um, while I was just enjoying that moment I realized that I hadn't associated God with being like a sunny day but like but I thought of him as being like a cloudy day making my life more dull and heavy and boring and and I just when I realized that I had believed that I just thought that's such a lie um, God is the author of all things life-giving and and beautiful and like the Sun he came down into our darkness um, to bring us up out of the darkness into the light, yeah, to enjoy a beautiful life with him. And yeah, he is all about a, a fun day at the beach. He's about fun and about, yeah, good things. Um, yeah, so this song's called Blue Sky. Um, are you getting the guitar through? night you have become the blue sky by the sunrise you've been made so bright blue sky the crimson colors of sunrise have broken your night oh blue sky the sun that sat high gave up his glory in the sky to come down to the earth and to lay down his life. And as the sun set, his blood spilled over the night. As he became the black that belonged to you, his beloved. 
dark night you have become the blue sky by the sunrise you've been made so bright blue sky the crimson colors of sunrise have broken your night oh blue sky the love of Christ could not be held by the night as he shattered your dark to make you the blue of his pure life victorious beams have raised you up with him the new morning has come the new morning is you oh dark night you have become the blue sky by the sunrise You've been made so bright Blue sky and the crimson colors of sunrise Have broken your night Oh, blue sky Oh, blue sky darkness to light that's what happens when the sun rises with healing in his wings well that's an, another subject uh, for a, a health weekend when we have our guests here for Eden Point but uh, today we're going to be looking at the mountains of God let's pray before we begin Dear Father, we thank you for being our mountain of strength that we can hide in the cleft of the rock. And we thank you for giving us your Son, who is the chief cornerstone cut out of the mountain without hands. We're thankful that you have the power to do all things, infinite in wisdom and power. And we ask that you'll give us that blessing today that only you can give, that we may not fear, but go forward as part of your army in your strength to fulfill your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hacksaw Ridge. Heard about that? November 4, 3,000 theaters. Mel Gibson. Oh, should I mention Desmond Doss? I um, saw the, uh, the uh, documentary, which was excellent, because Desmond's right there. He's narrating much of it. Interview a lot of the people that were with him, fought with him uh, there in Okinawa. 
on uh, Maida Ridge, uh, uh, escarpment, Maida escarpment, where he rescued 75 soldiers on that occasion and more in other times. And uh, Mel Gibson's making a blockbuster movie. They're saying it's going to be just as good as The Passion, it's going to be just as gory, just as much blood shed, and just as much uh, special effects. And R rated. So, um, this is a mountain in Okinawa. There's a mountain. Was it a mountain of God? God was there and God was working in the life of Desmond Doss. And uh, it is inescapable that it was a miracle that he wasn't one of the casualties. Now, he got wounded. He got wounded. But it was only a flesh wound. <laughs> he was there in front of President Truman receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in his arm in a sling. Uh, that's just one instance, and we're going to come back and touch on it again, but the theme today is what God wants to do in his children with his power. Despite all odds against insurmountable uh, odds, uh, threat, where fear could paralyze, God strengthens and enables. And he did it in the life of Desmond Doss. So um, it's coming out November 4, four days before election. Is that strategically planned? I don't know. But uh, We're familiar with uh, pairs in the Bible, besides uh, the mountains of God, which, uh, by the way, are, um, let's turn to our scripture reading today. It's Zechariah, next to the last book in the Old Testament. And it's chapter 6 which we'll focus on. And Zechariah chapter 6 ends with this um, scripture reading that we had concerning the branch who is going to build the temple of the Lord. Twice. You notice it says, he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he shall build the temple of the Lord. It says it twice. How many times did Jesus cleanse the temple? Twice. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end. And he shall rule upon his throne. He shall bear the glory. He shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Now, we end with this, and uh, actually I'm beginning with it here, but uh, the chapter ends with it. And in the context of this, let's read now verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Zechariah has been seeing a, a series of visions. And this is one more. He has seen uh, the man come out of the myrtle trees and um, the carpenters, the four carpenters, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, the powers of the Gentiles. He sees the measuring line to measure Jerusalem. And the Lord of hosts who guards and protects the apple of his eye. He sees Joshua the high priest standing before the altar with the angel of the Lord by his side and Satan at his right hand to resist him. And they bring forth this stone which has seven eyes. And then he sees the vision of the two olive trees. And again the stone shows up. 
which has the seven eyes are mentioned again. These seven, it says, are those, the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. The two olive trees are the source of the oil that flows through the golden pipes to the golden bowl where they are, is mingled and supplies oil, power, to light the seven lamps on the menorah. So these are the visions that he's had so far. And then the flying scroll, that's chapter 5. And the woman that's put in the ephah and the storks carry her off into the land of Shinar, the plain of Shinar, Babylon. And it says this is evil. Okay, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I turned and lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots. There were four carpenters back there in chapter 2, remember? Four chariots out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. Have you ever seen a brass mountain? Uh, what, what's made out of brass? Uh, let's see. Keys are made out of brass. Uh, have you ever... Huh? Trumpets made out of brass, yeah, and uh, the brass instruments, uh, trombones and French horns and tubas and cymbals are made out of brass. Um, let's see, if you go around on the merry-go-round, you can reach out for that brass ring. Well, let's have, have it in the Bible. Where do we see brass in the Bible? Huh? The laver was made out of brass, that's right. And in fact, many of the vessels were made out of brass, it says. Uh, and, uh, huh? Yes, the uh, statue, the metal man in Daniel 2, his thighs, belly and thighs were of brass. Yeah. In a sequence of metals of increasing strength, top to bottom, or hardness, malleability, Gold, the softest metal, and then silver, and a little less, and brass, harder. Iron, the hardest. Okay, um, there's some more. Let's turn to Leviticus 26, 19. Leviticus 26. This is in a chapter which is going to talk about blessings and curses. We talked about that in, Bible, in uh, Sabbath school, didn't we? Blessings and curses. Right at the end there, we talked about that double meaning of Barak, B-R-K, the three consonants that form that Hebrew root. can mean blessing or it can mean curses, depending on how you engage with that. Whether you accept God's word or you reject it. If you walk in my statutes, verse 3, keep my commandments and do them, then look at all the blessings that rain, your crops are going to grow, you're going to dwell in the land safely, you're going to eat bread to the full, you'll have peace. You'll be fruitful, your, your family will multiply, uh, your, your herds will multiply, you will uh, and God will walk among you, verse 12. Well, there's a lot of good blessings there in, in accepting and doing His Word. Now, Leviticus 26, 19. Now, verse 14 is the switching point here. But... If you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments and you despise my statutes, if your soul abhors my judgments so that you will not do my commandments, well, you get the, you get the picture here. <laughs> it's either cooperating with God and doing and walking with Him so He can walk with you or you say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I've got better. I've got something an improved ver my improved version. And after people do that for a while and they're, they're not as successful as they thought they might be,
it's tempting to ask how's that going for you God tells them what will happen if they do that verse 19 I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass now iron and brass go together so many times uh, as you go searching through the Bible you'll find them together because they are the two hardest metals known in the Bible anyway and they are symbols of either they can be they can be both they can be a symbol of steadfastness immovability determination integrity I'm going to keep God's law no matter what Desmond Doss says I can't touch that gun I cannot take human life I'm here to serve I'm here to protect and, and help but I cannot do this he was determined and they tried and tried if you haven't seen the movie you'll see it's depicted pretty well they've done a pretty good job of uh, showing his determination and they made it rough on him he was really put to the test are you really gonna stick to your guns he did so brass and iron can be good I'm immovable and staying loyal to God's word or it can be a symbol of stubbornness and rejection and refusing I will not listen to God's word I am not gonna move from my determination to go a different path now what happens what does it say here 19 if uh, you make if if you <laughs> if you don't keep my commandments my statutes and so on I will make heaven above his iron now what happens if you got an iron covering over your fields and you're dependent on things growing and you got an iron not too much stuff grows inside this metal building here even those things they're green but uh, artificially um, we do have some live plants but we've got to take them out to the Sun we've got to water them so if he's he's talking about making the heavens above iron what does that mean no rain for you and your earth underneath is brass dry hard hard pan clay <laughs> not gonna grow well where else do we see um, this is in Deuteronomy 28 23 if you want to look that one up you uh, it's the same thing except it's reverse order now the heaven above is brass and the earth beneath is iron but the message is the same and it's because they have refused hardness firmness resistance Deuteronomy 33 25 is a <clears throat> prophecy now uh, Moses has been going down through the 12 tribes and he comes to the tribe of Asher Deuteronomy 33 verse 25 he says your shoes shall be iron and brass you got any uh, steel toed boots can you imagine a whole shoe made out of iron be pretty heavy uh, and brass but what does it mean here as your days so shall your strength be well iron and brass are a symbol of strength in this case uh, what does he say you walked 40 years in the wilderness and your shoes didn't wear out your clothes didn't uh, get moth-eaten <laughs> didn't go threadbare he's gonna preserve you iron and brass job oh we were uh, we're in job 
Sabbath school, Job chapter 6, verse 12, question is asked, is my strength the strength of stones? Is my flesh brass? See the parallel is? He's talking about strength. Brass is brought into the picture. It's a symbol of strength. In uh, Job 40, verse 18, he says, Leviathan's stones are like strong pieces of brass, like bars of iron. Leviathan, some kind of a large behemoth, behemoth sea or water creature, maybe a um, dinosaur of sorts. Isaiah 48, 4, a brow of brass. Your brow is of brass. Now, that can mean stubbornness again. Hard-headed, we say. Sign of obstinance. The word obstinance is used there. Remember, Moses put the serpent on a pole, and that serpent was made out of brass. Nephemish or something like that. What was the name of that they called it? Nahem, Nahemish? Nephemish? Strong medicine for snake bites. Look and live. Samson was uh, fettered with Bands of brass, fetters of brass, Judges 16. Goliath was covered with armor made out of brass. Breastplate, was a shield, they were all brass. Two pillars in front of Solomon's temple. Uh, Jachin, or I don't know how you pronounce that, Yakin, Yakin, and Boaz. Now, Boaz means strength. Book of Ruth, Boaz, he was a Mighty man, powerful man in that community there in Bethlehem. So brass speaks of things strong. Now what about mountains? These mountains are of brass. What about mountains? Isaiah 40 verse 9. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. Oh, that's from the Messiah, Handel's Messiah. Get thee up into the high mountain. What's that aria? Thou that bringest good. Oh, thou that bringest good. Get thee up into the high mountain. Anyway, oh, oh Jerusalem that bringest good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. See the parallel? High mountain, strength. Um, Psalm 30, verse 7. Thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Uh, Psalm 65, verse 6. God, by his strength, sets fast the mountains. The pump of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate. Ezekiel 33, verse 28. Remember Elijah. Running from Jezebel. He goes down to Horeb, the mountain of God. And he's hiding out in a cave there. And 1 Kings 19, verse 11, The Lord passed by and a strong wind rent the mountains, it says. Tornado. Just picked up those boulders and threw them around. Micah 6 2. Oh, we, we sang Micah 6, uh, 4 2. Here's Micah 6 2. O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth. Mountains. Built on bedrock. So mountains are a symbol of strength. Brass is a symbol of strength. And if you've got two brass mountains, you really have something strong. This is the hyperbole, the superlative, the strength of all strength that could be expressed in Bible symbols. And it is between these two brass mountains that these four chariots come forth. Uh, let's go back to Zechariah 6 because I want to read the, exactly the uh, wording here. Zechariah Six. It says they come forth. Verse 5. 
first of all, verse 4, uh, Zechariah says, what are these? <laughs> you know, red horses, black horses, white horses, and grizzled bay horses. Different colors. Where do you see those colors again? Horses with... Only in Revelation chapter 6, this is Jack, Zechariah chapter 6, in Revelation chapter 6, you've got white horses, then red, then black, then pale, or grizzled. The same colors, a little different order. So he says, what are these? Zechariah wants to know. The angel says, these are four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Now, where are these chariots with these horses coming from? From between two mountains, two brass mountains. They're standing before the Lord of all the earth. And they come forth. And then it says they go forth, they come forth to go forth. They go to the north, to the south, and they walk to and fro through the earth, verse 7. So, we have in Revelation, chapter 14, three angels taking messages. And that first message is the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. They're going forth into all the earth as well. The horses of the Lord. That's another interesting symbol. What are the horses? Who are the horses? In Revelation 19, we have the word, it says. His name is the Word, written on his thigh, the Word of God. Riding on a white horse, coming out of heaven, leading the armies of heaven. So you, hear, you have all these, he's leading and we're, they're, they're following. What did Jesus say? Follow me. His people. Now, when Dennis and Laura were with us last Sunday, and we watched this video by Andrew Henrique, he pointed out that uh, the horses, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, it was um, Lem Ramirez. I was reading his book on the Seven Seals. And he was saying that the horses, his, the four, first four of the se Seven Seals is the horses, are ridden by... The first horse we know is, is Jesus, right? He's got the crown, he's got a sword, he's going forth to conquer and to conquer. Going forth, conquering and to conquer. And uh, he's riding the horse, he's leading the horse, he's directing the horse. And he saw in this a symbol of his people. We are directed. Um, what does James say? You know, our tongue, you put a bridle in the horse in order to lead him where he should go. And uh, God is leading his people. He's directing them. He's showing them where to go, what to do. And each one of, this was a new idea, a new thought to me, that each one of these horses, Jesus is leading his people through different experiences. Um, I always, and it's not that one thing is true and the other is not true. There's two aspects here. Just as you're going to have blessings and curses, right? Same word. You have this red horse, next one coming up. White horse, victorious. Red. And uh, we've always, in, and it's, it's easy to see the persecution that followed when the early church began to grow and the message was taken far and uh, it was a threat to the empire initially and Nero and Diocletian, all those uh, emperors that followed saw Christianity as a threat to them and so there was persecution and there was bloodshed, red horse. But also in our own experience, in our own lives, 
the next step. After we accept Jesus and it's, it's a glorious experience and the light, the sun rises and that cloudy darkness turns to a blue sky, we realize that we need to die. There needs to be a death to ourselves, a sacrifice. As you mentioned there, in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, for this is your reasonable service. <laughs> That's the way we sing it. So there is a thought in which each one of these, Jesus is with us as we go through these experiences. He is on the horse. He is directing. He is in control. That's a good thought, isn't it? It's comforting to know that we don't go out into battle by ourselves. Two brass mountains. The mountains of God. The Lord's anointed will sit upon the throne in Zion. My holy mountain, he says in Psalm 2, second Psalm. Lucifer, the anointed cherub, walked up and down in the stones of fire in the mountain of God. In Ezekiel chapter 28. Moses came to the mountain of God in Horeb. It's like the one that... Zach, uh, Elijah ran to and hid in the cave. Moses was on the mountain of God in Horeb when he saw this burning bush. Ezek uh, Exodus chapter 3. You read about it there. And what happened? A voice came out of the burning bush, told him to do something take off his shoes because. This is holy ground. The presence of God is there, and that's what makes it holy. This is the mountain of God. Well, besides Horeb, Elijah and Moses both had experiences on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There's another mountain called the mountain of God. Let's uh, turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, familiar story. It says, uh, God did tempt Abraham. Well, we would think maybe this was a test. God tested him. Was Job tested? Yeah. And in that test, are you tempted? To wonder why this is happening. Yeah, we, we wondered that. Why is this happening to me? It's a tempting thought, all right? And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get you into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Where is he going? Moriah. Where is Moriah? It takes him three days to get there. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifts up his eyes and he sees the place afar off. And he says to the young man, he took some helpers with him, some of his servants, abide here with the, with the donkey, with the ass, with the beast of burden, they brought all our supplies with us. It took three days to get there, and it's going to take three days to get back. So, you know, you have to take some provisions. And I and the lad, I and my son, whom I love, my only son, will go yonder and worship and come again to you. What has he been asked to do? Well, he knows what he's on a mission. I don't think he's told Isaac because... Isaac wonders where the lamb is. They're walking up the mountain. He says, I'm carrying the wood. 
Who carried the wood up Mount Calvary? The Son did, right? The Son of God. Yeah, part of the way. I've got the wood. Here's the fire. Where's the lamb? Isaac doesn't know about this mission that they're on. He thinks it's just another sacrifice. Abraham doesn't tell him then. God will provide himself a lamb. And they went on both of them together. And God did provide a lamb. Didn't he? he provided a ram in this instance, caught in the thicket. God provided a lamb, the lamb of God, caught in the sin of this world as our substitute. Well, this was a powerful experience for Abraham on Mount Moriah. You might call it a, one of the mountains of brass. That was a hard thing for Abraham to do, wasn't it? But he was determined to follow God's command. That's brass. Hard. Not going to be moved. Immovable. Mount Moriah was one of those mountains of God. This same mountain appears again in Second Chronicles chapter 3. Now, this is a thousand years later, folks. Second Chronicles. Oh, first Second Kings, First Second Chronicles. Chapter 3, Solomon, another son, son of David, is going to be building the temple. David had already purchased the land on which the temple was going to be built. And it describes that event here in verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah where Abraham offered up Isaac and where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Onan. You remember the story? David had sinned. The wages of sin is death. He had um, engineered the death of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite. Oh, cleverly done. Nobody knew about it except Joab knew about the orders to make it happen. He may not have known all the sordid details behind the reason for this, but I bet he wasn't unsuspecting. And uh, David and Bathsheba had a son. And God um, said, there's consequences. I can't protect you in these circumstances. I can't protect this son. The son died. But then there's other things that come. That's just the beginning of sorrows. And he says... There are demands being made. Either you be subjected to three years of your enemies coming in and ravishing the land, or three months of disease and. No, oh, what was the next one? I remember it was three months and three days, wasn't it? It got down to three days, was the last one. He says. Uh, the, oh, a pestilence, and then three days in the hands of the Lord. And he says, well, let me put myself in the hands of the Lord. So people start dying. And there was thousands of people were dying, and, and finally David says, enough, enough, enough. This is my fault. Why are they having to die for this? This is my sin. 
And he goes to the threshing floor of Onan where he sees the angel with the sword raised. This angel judgment, executing judgment. And he buys the land from Onan. And he sacrifices there on the spot where Abraham offered up Isaac. He sacrifices where the temple is going to be built now and sacrifices are going to be made. All pointing toward Isaac's sacrifice, Abel's sacrifice way back in the beginning, David's sacrifice, all the sacrifices leading up to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, all pointing toward him. And that spot on Mount Moriah a mountain of God, firm as brass. Was there anything that would change God's mind, that would alter his course, alter the words that come out of his mouth, or is, what is it, Psalm 89, I'll alter the things which come forth out of my lips, yeah, is the words there. No! God is a mountain of brass. He is firm. In the garden, Jesus said, if this cup can pass from me, is that possible? It wasn't possible. He had to drink the cup. The sacrifice had to be made. And it was made. Close by, outside the city. Mount Moriah is inside the city walls. The Temple Mount is a mountain of brass. Outside the city, another mountain was climbed by the Son of God. And his father was there. Golgotha, Calvary, has different names. And this son was as strong as brass. You know, Daniel and John both saw Jesus with the appearance of brass. Daniel 10 is the first place. And you'll see it's the same description that John has later on. Daniel 10, verse 5 and 6. He lifted up his eyes, Daniel did, and he saw a man clothed in linen. Oh, who wears linen? The priests. Here's a priest whose loins were girded with fine gold. Ooh, he's got a golden girdle. Remember that. His body is like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning. Remember on uh, Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus' had, his face was like lightning, it says. Bright as the sun. His eyes like lamps of fire. His arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. Arms and legs. His, his extremities like brass. No, okay, let's go to Revelation chapter 1. We'll see the same description here of Jesus again. The Son of Man, it says, walking among the candlesticks. And in chapter 1, and um, his hair of his head is verse 14. Oh, no, let's go back up 13. Uh, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to his foot, probably linen, it doesn't say linen here, Girt, about, perhaps with a golden girdle. There's the same golden girdle. His head and his hair is white as snow, his uh, eyes like the flame of fire, same. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Molten brass. Just giving off this iridescent, I mean it's incandescent brass. Giving off its own light because it's white hot. Red hot? Brass is kind of a red color. So here's, here's Jesus being seen, the Son of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Brass. Revelation 2, verse 18, just uh, for 
Confirmation again. This is to the church of Thyatira. These things saith the Son of God, who has eyes like unto the flame of fire, which is red, and his feet like fine brass. So, uh, clearly, we, we see the brass symbology here in the Son of God. How beautiful upon the mountain were the feet of him who brought forth good tidings, good news, the gospel. Jesus climbed Mount Calvary with feet of brass. Determined. He couldn't. Luke chapter 9 says he was going to Jerusalem with his face set like a flint. The flint's kind of hard too. You know, you can make sparks with flint. Scratching it on other rocks. Flint, hard. Determined. On, he could not be changed. What were his weapons? Ah, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is an interesting text. 2 Corinthians 10. And starting with 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare. Do we have weapons? Let us be clothed with the armor of God and take forth the sword of the Spirit. Right? That's one of the weapons. But our weapons are not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're not man-made weapons. Are we going to pick up, are we going to store up ammunition and artillery and, and M16s or whatever, AK-47, I don't, I don't know all this terminology. What, all these survivalists, you know, they're going to barricade themselves and they shoot it out to the end. Is that what we're going to do? Is that the weapons of our warfare. No, our war weapons are not carnal, but mighty, they're stronger, they're better than that. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These weapons are weapons of brass <laughs> that are stronger than strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Obedience. Walking with feet of brass. Jesus says, I do always keep my Father's commandments. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says, He did learn obedience by the things which He suffered. Job suffered. Did he learn obedience? Yeah. When we suffer, count, count all, what is it, James? <laughs> count, count all, um, uh, oh, come on, what's the word? I'm, I'm going to blank out on these things. Um, count it all joy. <laughs> When you find you fall into time, divers temptations. Uh, for our sufferings work of patience. Right? The trying of your faith work of patience. And there on the cross, Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. But they were no match for the brass mountain. <laughs> he made a show of them openly. It's Colossians 2 verse 15. Triumphing over them in the cross. What was his weapon? Hebrews 2, verse 9, we see, look, look unto G, we see Jesus uh, made a little lower than the angels that he might by suffering destroy him who had the power over death. He was made like, uh, took on flesh and blood like his uh, brethren that he might die. That was his weapon. Who is this king of glory? 
Psalm 24. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Isaiah 59, 16. The Lord saw that there was no man, no intercessor. Therefore, his arm... What's the arm like unto? Has the appearance of brass. His arm brought salvation unto him. It says it again in chapter 63, verse 5. I looked and there was none to help. I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me. Powerful arm. Strong arm. The Father's own arm of polished brass. Mighty to save. Verse 2, Isaiah 63 says, Why are you red in your apparel, and your garments like one that treads in the wine vat? It says wine fat in King James, but I think it means the vat in which they tread the grapes, right? You get kind of red stained if you got Concord grapes. The answer is in verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. Why alone? Why did Jesus die alone? Desire of Ages tells us, page 22, only one being in all the universe could manifest the character of God in contrast to the character of Satan. There was no one else. Father, if this cup can possibly be taken, there was no one else. Only He. The only being in all the universe. Again, in Desire of Ages, it says, well, no, in Great Controversy, it says, the only being in all the universe that could enter into the counsels and purposes of God. With arms and feet like fine polished brass burned in a furnace, he was strong as brass on a mountain as unyielding as brass. For love is strong as death. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. The flames there are are flames of fire which have a most vehement heat. That brass is just glowing. Love. It's glowing with the power of love. <laughs> love heated up that brass. Two mountains, Mount Moriah inside the city, Mount Calvary outside the city. And two mountains remain at the very end. We talked about the stone cut out of the mountain without hand, Daniel 2, verse 45. It strikes the image on the feet grinds all those metals, including the brass, the earthly brass. Heavenly brass is stronger than earthly brass, I suspect. Grinds it to powder, it's blown away, and that stone cut out of the mountain becomes a mountain itself. Two mountains. Two mountains of brass. Immovable unchangeable. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And the branch shall build the temple of the Lord. Even He shall build the temple of the Lord. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Received a book this week called A House Not Divided. I wanted to read something that fits in with the Desmond Doss story. Hacksaw Ridge. Mountains of brass. Determination. Power. And strength. God's power. He's infinite in his ability 
to overrule in the affairs of men. The right to bear arms is a right guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States of America. A right, along with all the others, which should ever be maintained. Through such means, however, the war which we fight will never be won. No one who loves and serves the true and living God will ever take carnal weapons in their hands. The victory that overcomes this world is this, even our faith. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? I always thought that meant, will there be anybody who believes in Jesus? I think it goes beyond that. I see this as a trusting dependence on that mountain of brass to be our strength, not to resort to human responses, and I'll do it, I'll defend myself. That's the kind of faith that Jesus had in his father. It's the kind of faith that Job had in spite of what looked like was happening, in spite of all the evidence around us. We are in a war, an ugly war. It is Satan who incites to war. Satan delights in war. Satan delights in human suffering. Satan endeavors through whatever means to cause men to forget God and bring down upon themselves a behavior like that of a brute. But Jesus says, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. No weapon which is formed against thee, Isaiah 54, verse 17, shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shall thou condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord Melissa, come and give us your message and song. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your message, Gary. Um, I'm actually not going to use the slide because I'm going to change the song because... Oh. It's more fitting, but, okay. <laughs> but um, I was struggling so much with my, with a sense of my own weaknesses and inadequacies, and and I was actually still doing music ministry, and one particular night I just couldn't sleep because I was saying, God, I just feel like a a big hypocrite. I don't know how to be a Christian. I, I've been struggling with the same things for so long, and I was sure that God would be ashamed of me and um, wouldn't want anything to do with me anymore. <laughs> Sorry, that's my baby. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I was sure that he'd be ashamed of me. And um, anyway, I just said to God, God, I don't know, I don't know how to follow you. I don't know how to do this. Maybe I'll just have to go my own way. And when I told God I would, I would have to go to my own way, I, my heart just broke because God had always felt like my closest friend. And I just, I just started to cry. And my friend could hear me crying. And she came over to me and she just said. Melissa, um, don't you know God will never give up on you? And God just started to help me realize it's not, it's not me trying to strive my way up to him, but it's actually him who comes right to where I am. And he takes responsibility for me in my weakness because he's my dad and he's a good dad. Um, and I'm just so grateful for that because if it was the other way around, I'd just have no hope at all. I know that. I just, I'm so grateful that um, God loves me with a love um, that is stronger than death and that he fights for me more fiercely than I can ever know. <laughs> so this song came from that night. 
Here he comes, riding on a white horse To pull me out from the midst of my enemy My faithful one Here he comes, to vanquish his enemies Fighting with a fierce love I love stronger than death My true one, soft in the stillness of night Gentle and quiet His voice assured me again Child, I'm not finished yet Let your heart rest I won't let you slip through my fingers Here he comes Riding on a white horse To pull me out from the midst of my enemy My faithful one Here he comes To vanquish his enemies Fighting with a fierce love I love stronger than death My true one He holds me Oh, he holds me so closely I am his And by his grace He is mine No Power can loosen his grip on me I'm so tightly held by his mighty love If I say my foot is slipping Your mercy, O oh Lord, holds me up In the multitude of my thoughts your comforts delight my soul Oh, here he comes Here he comes Riding on a white horse To pull me out from the midst of my enemy My faithful one Good choice. Here he comes, riding on a white horse. And we can cling to him, who is our life. Deuteronomy 30, that's a nice text. You ever notice that one? This is the one that I think, well, this is after. Jacob wrestled, but maybe it's thinking of Jacob. Verse 20. Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Parting words of advice from Moses. Love the Lord thy God. Obey his voice. Cleave unto him. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Cleave unto him. For he is your life and the length of your days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your infinite love that never lets go that's stronger than death, that holds on to us even though we have let go. Be our shield and our comforter. Hold us tight as we hold on to you and keep us ever in your care. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus who will bless us throughout the rest of this Sabbath day and bless our fellowship, our meal together, and our continued worship. Amen.